Hi, everybody. Welcome to week two, uh, where we're going to talk about the logical toolkit. So logic and critical thinking, uh, propositions and arguments. Now, before we get going today, I want to just remind everybody to participate in your discussions and assessments. Uh, good work to those of you who have been participating in the discussions. There's been a lot of a lot of good comments and discussions. Uh, those of you that have added the class late, please make sure you are going back to week one and doing the discussions, doing the assessments, uh, listening to the first lecture. And if you happen to turn something in from week one this week, it's still okay. Uh, I'm not going to take any late points off since so many people have been added late. However, this will be your last week to get anything from week one done. So week one material in terms of the discussion and the assessments will close this Sunday and I will not open those back up. So please make sure you are getting week one stuff done. If you don't get week two stuff done and you get it done next week and week three, that's when the deductions will occur. So please make sure that you are going through familiarizing yourself with Blackboard and doing the discussions and the assessments and catching up to, to what we're doing. If you have any questions, remember you can email me, you can uh, post in the Q&A discussion thread, or if you want to text uh, the Google Hangouts number or call the Google Hangouts number on the syllabus, I can speak with you that way. So uh, without further ado, let's get going for week two. What we'll be talking about today is the process and tools that you will need to evaluate and make good arguments. And it's important to note when we talk about arguments, we're not talking about bickering back and forth or yelling loudly at one another. It's not the stuff that we see on the news where two people are just screaming and talking past each other. In academia, when it comes to logic and philosophy, arguments are essentially assertions that are made about the world that are defended with evidence. So anytime you make a claim about anything and then support that claim with a piece of evidence, you are creating an argument. So if you were to say, I should take the 805 to work today because the five is going to be too crowded or there won't be an, uh, as much traffic on the 805, this is an argument that you make. You're supporting your claim that you should take the 805 with pieces of evidence that the 805 is less crowded or the 5 is more crowded. We do this a hundred times a day, every day, and we'll continue to do so for the rest of our lives. Whether we're talking to ourselves about what type of phone to buy, whether or not to sign up for a credit card, where to go on vacation, all of these are arguments. We don't think of them as arguments because it's not that bickering back and forth, but this is what an argument is. It's a claim that's made that's then supported by a piece of information or evidence. The problem with arguments is we're not really taught how to evaluate them or make them. We simply just uh, see our parents or teachers uh, do it and we start to mimic it. We say things that sound right and sound good but often are not so. There is a very specific process and a science to evaluating arguments. And if you don't understand that process, you can be convinced by your rationalities and the arguments you make can be irrational themselves. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to understand a little bit more about what makes a good argument and how we should go about evaluating them because we don't wanna be persuaded by irrationality. We don't want to be persuaded by emotion or feelings. We want good, reasonable, rational arguments. And when we're expressing things to others, we want to make sure that we're being persuasive because of our rationality as well. Now, what we're going to look at today are arguments, but what we need to go over first are the propositions that make up arguments. Arguments are made of propositions, so we're going to take a look at propositions first. Now, there are three types of logic. However, we're not really going to touch on them so much because for the course, deductive arguments are the ones that we're concerned with. 
And deductive arguments are the types of arguments that deduce certainty from a claim. So whether or not something is true or false is based on its deductive logic. Inductive and abductive logic are also fields of logic, but we're not going to be concerned with them here. So after we go through our arguments, we'll start to look at evaluating them, and then I'll have a couple practice examples for you. First things first, propositions. Now, propositions are what make up arguments. And what a proposition is, is a statement that could be true or could be false. It is a statement that has a truth value, meaning that if I make a claim about the world and that claim is either true or false, regardless if it, it is true or it is false, it is a proposition. Propositions are important because claims that are true and false are the only way that we can evaluate whether or not an argument is going to be good or bad. You can't evaluate an argument if the parts of that argument can't be true or false. Let me give you some examples of propositions and some examples of non-propositions. Chocolate makes you fat. This is a proposition. It's either true or it's false that chocolate makes you fat. It doesn't matter if it is true or false, just simply that it could be true or false we have a truth value that we can associate to that. Same thing with I am giving a lecture. In my case, it is true that I'm giving a lecture. In your case, it is false that you're giving a lecture. But as long as we can say true or false, we are claiming a proposition. Now, if I were to say, give me 20 push-ups, Munch, this would not be a proposition because it's not a claim that's true or false. It's simply a claim that's stated. It's a directive that's been given. It's, it would be silly for you to hear, give me 20 push-ups and respond, false, sir. It just doesn't make sense to provide a truth value to that sentence. Because we can't determine whether that's true or false, it's not a proposition. Same thing goes with number four. Does chocolate make you fat? This is a question. I'm inquiring about the world. I'm not claiming anything about the world. So the mere fact of me asking a question cannot be true or false. Only the answer to the question is true or false. So number four is not a proposition. Number five, chickens fly in the southern hemisphere. Even though this is blatantly false, it is a proposition because it's false. Anything that has a truth value, meaning anything that's true, anything that's false, is a proposition. Number six, can you really believe that? Again, questions cannot be propositions because the question itself is not true or false, only the answer. Similarly, number seven, I wonder if I should take the five or the 805. You're not actually making a claim about the world. You're simply wondering something. And, and that, that wondering is, is not true or false. It's just happening. And so if I were to say I should take the five to work, then that would be a proposition. But if you were just, I wonder if I should take the five or the 805, it's that wonder is not going to be true or false about the world. Number eight, triangles have three sides. This is a proposition because it's true. And remember, anything that's true or anything that's false is a proposition. Number nine, John, this is not a proposition. The, the mere act of screaming somebody's name cannot be true or false. Lastly, Texas is the largest state in the United States of America. This is a proposition even though it is obviously false. Alaska is the largest state in the United States of America. So remember, if it's true or if it's false or it could be true or false, it is a proposition. Because when we're trying to evaluate an argument, those pieces that make up that argument need to be determined based on their truth or falsity. If we can't determine their truth or falsity, then we'll never be able to determine if the argument is good or bad. 
So when we think of a preposition, we're thinking of the truth condition that it's defined by. And any two statements that have the same truth condition are said to be true and false in exactly the same situation. Now this is important because as you go through this class, you're going to be reading a lot of material. And if somebody says something or you read something where a statement is said slightly different than another statement, but those statements are clearly expressing the same idea, these two statements are the same. So if I were to tell you John loves Mary or Mary is loved by John, these two propositions are the same thing. They contain the same essence and are pointing to the same fact of the world. One is in passive, one is in active, and linguistically they're slightly different. In logic, they are identical. We think of a proposition as that truth condition, that essence behind a statement. We want to think of propositions as that logical essence. It's the surrounding information, the packaging of what we're going to be working with. So when we're reading, we are going to be recognizing the truth and falsity of the statements being made, and it's our job to then determine what the evidence is and what the main claim is and whether or not the evidence supports that claim. Now that we have a grasp of propositions, we can look at arguments. And what an argument is, is multiple propositions put together where one or more of those propositions support one other. Here we have an example of an argument. Premises are the reasons or support to the conclusion or the main claim that's trying to be proved. Here I'm trying to prove that Jessica is clever. And the reason that I believe Jessica is clever is because all cats are clever and Jessica is a cat. Therefore, Jessica is clever. Here, my two premises support my conclusion. And therefore, I have an argument. Now, this statement, San Diego State University is the best college in the world, by itself is not an argument because there is no supporting piece of information. Every argument needs at least two propositions to be an argument. If I were to add three other propositions to this, however, it still would not be an argument. Because even though I have more than one proposition, none of these four propositions work to support one another. So in order to have an argument, you need two or more propositions where one supports the other. Here is another example. When arguments are written in bullet form, we often call them arguments in standard form or premise conclusion form. In standard form, the bottom most bullet is the conclusion and the two or however many bullets above that are the premises or reasons. So here again, I'm concluding that Jessica is clever and I believe that because all cats are clever and Jessica is a cat. In this argument, I have only two propositions where one premise supports one conclusion. John is not sad because John is happy. Here we have three premises and one conclusion, making four propositions in total. And we can have as many premises as we want, 20, 30, 40. That'll be a long argument and a mouthful, but it'll be an argument. Here, I'm proving that Jessica is an animal, and I believe that because all cats are mammals, all mammals are animals, and Jessica is a cat, therefore Jessica is an animal. Now, when we're forming arguments, it's the premises that are going to be the information that's taken for granted. They need to be the most obvious, commonsensical piece of information that you provide, because if they're not, then you will need to argue for your premise. And if you're arguing for your premise, then it becomes the new conclusion and you will need more premises to prove it. Take for instance this argument. 
Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional. And if Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional, it can't be enforced. Trump's travel ban, therefore, can't be enforced. Now, this was a hot topic of debate a year or two ago, and the reason was because of premise one. This was a controversial premise because some people believed that Trump's travel ban was constitutional. And so in order for me to prove that Trump's travel ban can't be enforced, I need to first prove that Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional. So I would need two premises or more above premise one, and premise one would be my new conclusion. Here is that argument. I'm trying to now prove that Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional, conclusion one, and I do that by assuming that something is unconstitutional if the court deems it so, and the court deemed Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional originally, therefore Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional. And if Trump's travel ban is unconstitutional, it can't be enforced, therefore Trump's travel ban can't be enforced. You can see how we can lengthen arguments just by adding more and more premises to the argument. If our argument, our premises are not clear cut, if they're not obvious and common understanding, then we will then have to argue for that. And if those premises aren't obvious, we will have to argue for them and so on and so forth. So it would be in our best interest to make premises that are as clear and understandable as humanly possible. So now getting into how we evaluate arguments. Now that we've seen a couple examples of arguments in standard form, it's time to evaluate or learn how to evaluate them. Because remember, we can have arguments that sound good but are actually bad, and arguments that sound bad and are actually good. Logic is that science for how we evaluate arguments, and it's a science that most of us haven't been taught and don't do. For some reason, we weren't brought up learning this information, and so we've just mimicked others. Now, when it comes to actually using it in the real world, we often do it poorly and are guided by irrational arguments and emotion. We want to make sure that when we make a persuasive argument, we're doing it through rationality. If the argument is not made rationally and instead is made emotionally or irrationally, then we are being persuaded with bad information. When we evaluate arguments, we do so in two ways structure, and content. If an argument is to have good structure, then the premises support the conclusion. If the premises do not support the conclusion, this is bad structure. Once we know if there is good structure in our argument, we look to see if the premises are true or false. True premises make an argument sound and good. If we have false premises, the content is poor and the argument is unsound. We will talk about that in a little bit. Look at this argument. Tell me if this argument, or tell me why this argument is bad. Either the content is bad or the structure is bad. I'll give you a minute to decide. This argument is bad because it has bad structure. If James walks out the door to this class, then he will be outside. James is outside. James must have walked out the door to this class. These two premises do not support the conclusion. This is an irrational argument that does not make sense. It claims that if James walks out the door to this class, then he'll be outside. And it shows us that James is outside, but... Perhaps we can imagine James getting outside in a different way. Perhaps he went through the window or dug a hole under the wall. Maybe he went through the ventilation system. 
because I can imagine worlds in which James has gotten outside without walking out the door, my conclusion here is not guaranteed by the premises. The premises do not support this, and it is a bad argument. Here, however, we have an argument where the structure is good, but the content is bad. Donald Trump is a highly popular president, and if the president is highly popular, he is likely to be a good leader. Trump is likely to be a good leader. Now, if we believe the premises, we are guaranteed the conclusion. The only problem is premise two, if the president is highly popular, he is likely to be a good leader, is false. Because that premise is false, we should not believe this argument, and it is a bad argument. When we talk about validity, we're talking about the structure of an argument. We're talking about how each proposition relates to the other. A valid argument is one in which the premises infer the conclusion, meaning that the conclusion is guaranteed by the truth of the premises. When you're deciding whether an argument's valid, ask yourself, is it possible to accept the premises and deny the conclusion? So pretend the premises are true and ask yourself, is there any way in the world I can deny the conclusion? Let's give it a go. Is this argument valid? Some soccer players are married to pop stars. David Beckham is married to a pop star. David Beckham is a soccer player. This argument is not valid because the premises do not support the conclusion. Just because some soccer players are married to pop stars and David Beckham is married to a pop star does not make David Beckham a soccer player. Instead, I can imagine a world where some soccer players are married to pop stars and David Beckham is married to a pop star. But the David Beckham that's married to a pop star is another David Beckham, not the soccer player, but the David Beckham the plumber. And if David Beckham, the plumber, is married to a pop star, then David Beckham, the plumber, is not a soccer player. He is a plumber. Because I've envisioned a world where my premises are true and my conclusion is false, the structure is poor and the premises do not infer the conclusion. Furthermore, David Beckham being a soccer player is not because he's married to a pop star and not because some soccer players are married to pop stars. There are a whole nother group of reasons why David Beckham is a soccer player. Just because this argument may sound good because you may already know who David Beckham is and who he's married to, does not mean the argument is actually a good one. It just may sound that way. Here's an example of an argument that sounds all right and that is terribly false. An equivalent argument would be something like this. My name is Alex. Because the sky is blue and I drink water. Therefore, my name is Alex. Clearly, I just listed a bunch of random statements that didn't go together. So is the same with this argument. These are random statements that do not go together. This argument is not for David Beckham being a soccer player. It's for something else. Because the structure is bad, this is an invalid argument, and an invalid argument is a very poor argument. How about this argument? Is this argument valid? This argument is valid. Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player. David Beckham, man, is married to a former Spice Girl, therefore David Beckham is a soccer player. Remember, validity is just the structure. So ask yourself, if the first two premises are true, do you have to accept the conclusion? And in this instance, yes, you do. There is no way to escape it. You have to accept the conclusion if you were to accept the premises. Same goes with this argument. All lions understand Spanish, some penguins are lions, therefore some penguins understand Spanish. 
it doesn't matter that each one of these propositions is complete gibberish. The fact remains that if the premises are true, the conclusion is guaranteed, and there is no way to escape the truth of the conclusion if the premises are true. This argument is as good structurally as it can get. Don't get confused by the content when you're dealing with structure, and validity is the structure. So an argument can be valid even if all of its propositions are false, or if one or all of its propositions are false but the conclusion is true. Valid arguments are arguments where the premises infer the conclusion. So an argument can be invalid even if all of its propositions are true. In the case of the David Beckham being married to a pop star, in that first argument that we looked at, all of those propositions were true, but the argument was still ridiculous because the premises did not guarantee the conclusion. The only way an argument cannot be valid is if all the premises are true and its conclusion is false. Because if the premises are true and the conclusion is false, then clearly the conclusion does not follow from the premises. So when we think about validity, we're thinking about the relationship between propositions. We're thinking not in virtue of the content, but how those propositions connect to one another. Looking back at that gibberish lion Spanish penguin argument, if you were to replace the nouns in that sentence with variables, you would see that the structure seems to make a bit more sense now. All L understand S, some P are L, therefore some P understand S. Because some P are L and all L understand S, we can get to our conclusion. There is no way to accept the premises and deny the conclusion in this example. Now, of course, validity itself does not make a good argument. There is more to good arguments than just structure. This is where soundness comes in. An argument is sound if first and foremost the argument is valid, and second, the argument must have true premises. Now we're focusing on the content and the structure more so than just the structure. So when we're determining the soundness of an argument, we're looking first if the structure is good, and if it is, then we look at the content. Is this argument sound? Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player. David Beckham is married to a former Spice Girl. Therefore, David Beckham is a soccer player. This argument is not sound. And the reason it's not sound is because the first premise is false. Every man married to a former Spice Girl is a soccer player is not true. There are people married to the other Spice Girls that are not soccer players. That statement is false. So even though the first two premises guarantee the conclusion in this argument, that first premise is false. How about this one? Some soccer players are married to pop stars. David Beckham is married to a pop star. Therefore, David Beckham is a soccer player. Here we have all true propositions. However, remember, this argument was invalid. And if it's invalid, it's automatically unsound. When an argument is invalid, it's automatically bad. Here's an example of a good sound argument. All cats are mammals, Jessica is a cat, therefore Jessica is a mammal. The premises lead to the conclusion, they guarantee it, so if I believe what's in black, I have to believe what's in red, I cannot deny it, and the two statements in black are true. Therefore, this is a good argument. You'll notice that most good arguments are pretty simple. Arguments that are typically controversial, whether it's capital punishment or abortion or global warming or economics, the reason that these are controversial is because we don't really have good sound arguments for them.
Sound arguments are difficult to come by because in addition to structure, you need good content. And remember, we're often used to finding good content, digging up facts, digging up statistics, but how you structure it is very important as well. And if it's not structured right, you're basically just speaking gibberish. So when we think of soundness, we think of a subset to valid arguments, meaning that an argument can be valid but not sound, but an argument that's sound cannot be valid. So if I were to ask you to evaluate an argument, which I'll do here in a minute, you will tell me if the argument is valid and sound, meaning it's a good argument, it's valid but unsound, which means the structure is good but the content is off, or it's invalid and unsound, the argument is just off because of structure. And if it's off because of structure, it's automatically useless. Again, this is the importance when it comes to forming good arguments. If an argument is being expressed to you out in the real world, let's say applying for a credit card or trying to buy a car at a dealership, the person expressing the argument might create a valid argument. And if it's valid, no amount of facts or statistics can help prove that point. A valid argument is a, or I'm sorry, an invalid argument is a terrible argument and equates to the earlier, my name is Alex because the sky is blue and I drink water. An invalid argument is just as ridiculous sounding as what I just mentioned. We want to make sure that we're structuring arguments properly and getting the content right. So we need to make sure that our reasons point us to the conclusion. They infer the conclusion. Our conclusion could not be denied if the premises are true. Once that structure is intact, then we can work on determining whether or not the premises are actually true. So in conclusion, we need two main things to have a good argument. We need structure, the validity, we need content, and the soundness. So here is an example of a question that you're gonna see on the assessment this week. Uh, I have three examples here. Uh, I'm simply going to lay out the argument uh, as such, and then we'll give you three options, valid and sound, valid but unsound and invalid and unsound. And I would like to know which one this is. So read this argument and let me know if this is valid and sound. This argument is valid but unsound. The structure is good, but the content is off. Here you have three premises. If you have a mullet, you are either very cool or very uncool. Michael has a mullet. Michael is not very cool. Therefore, the conclusion, Michael is very uncool. Now, if I were to believe the first three premises, I would have to accept the conclusion because essentially I'm giving you a conditional that if you have a mullet, you are either very cool or very uncool, two options. I then say you have a mullet, so I put you in this conditional of having two options being very cool or very uncool. I then say you are not very cool. You are left with being very uncool. The structure is good. The problem occurs in premise three where it says Michael is not very cool. Because this is so subjective, there's not really going to be a solid truth value we can place on it. Maybe his mom thinks he's not cool. Maybe his mom thinks he is cool. Maybe some friends think he's not cool, but other th friends think he's very cool. Because there's not going to be a clear-cut truth or falsity to this, we can't really use it to determine any conclusion about his coolness. The content is then off, uh, but the structure is good. How about this one? This argument is invalid and therefore unsound. I can believe a world where all logicians are mad, and I can also believe in a world where some mad people love Beethoven, 
but deny the idea that some logicians love Beethoven. The reason I can do this is because if all logicians are mad and some mad people love Beethoven, those mad people that love Beethoven can come from a different set than the mad people that are logicians and love Beethoven. And so we can't conclude that just because some mad people love Beethoven that that group of logicians overlaps with the group that loves Beethoven. Remember, ask yourself, if the first premises are true, or if the premises are true, can I deny the conclusion? And in this one, yes, you can. This should go to show how difficult it is to really look at arguments and evaluate them. Here you might have a couple of seconds to look at an argument or uh, a couple minutes even to think about why this is a good or bad argument. But in the real world, arguments come at you much quicker. And it's important that we evaluate them as quick as humanly possible. The more you do this, the quicker that you get. But without really understanding this science behind evaluating arguments, we're prone to making mistakes uh, because of emotion or irrationality. Let's take a look at the last argument. If this glass of water is fresh and not contaminated, then it's drinkable. This glass of water is not fresh, therefore this glass of water is not drinkable. Take a minute to determine the validity and soundness of this argument. This argument is also invalid and therefore unsound for a few reasons. If this glass of water is fresh and not contaminated, then it is drinkable. This glass of water is not fresh, therefore this glass of water is not drinkable. The first premise simply lays out conditions for what makes water drinkable. It does not state what makes water not drinkable, which means it could be one of many criteria of what make water drinkable. I could also imagine a world where water is not fresh and contaminated, but it is still drinkable. Perhaps water could not be fresh, but could be contaminated and it is drinkable. Imagine the real world. I actually have a bottle of water on my desk as we speak. This water, if fresh and not contaminated, then it is drinkable. No one would deny that. Now, the bottle of water on my desk right now, I filled up last night before bed, didn't really drink much water this morning, and now I'm drinking from the bottle now. So it's not fresh, but clearly I'm drinking from it. So the glass of water on my desk, or the bottle of water on my desk, is, if fresh and not contaminated, then it's drinkable, obviously. This is not drinkable. I'm sorry, this is not fresh, but it is drinkable. Remember, the first premise only gives us criteria for one way that water can be drinkable. It can also be drinkable in a lot of other ways. I have not given you criteria for what makes something not drinkable. Just because it doesn't meet that first criteria of the first premise doesn't mean you can assume it's opposite. You only can take what you get with the premises. And the premises say that if it's fresh and not contaminated, then it's drinkable, and this is not fresh. But still, water, if not fresh and even contaminated, is still drinkable. When we think about vitamin water or soda or other types of drinks, they are contaminated with sugars or iron, iron or calcium or whatever, but we still drink it. Remember, you're asking yourself structurally, if the premises are true, does the conclusion have to follow? In this instance, no, it does not. Because it doesn't follow, we don't have to accept this argument. The conclusion does not follow. It is a bad argument. Being rational and using logic is a very, very difficult undertaking that we are definitely not used to. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work to get better at doing this, and taking a course like philosophy will help in that endeavor. By reading the material and determining what sounds good and what sounds bad is only part of the battle. You need that rationale of determining, do the premises guarantee the conclusion? 
are the premises true? And if they are, should I accept the conclusion? We're going to be doing that throughout this entire course, and you're going to be expected to do this throughout your entire life. Whether you're deciding what college to go to, whether you're determining where to live or what type of credit card to take or where to go on vacation or should you get married or should you not get married? Should I have kids? Should I not have kids? All of these require making claims and supporting them with evidence. And if you're doing that in a way that you're not actually structuring the argument properly, you are doing a disservice to yourself and the world by being irrational. We want to make sure to create strong, valid, sound arguments where structure and content work together to make a persuasive argument. If you have any question about any of these slides or any of the answers to any of these slides, please make sure you're emailing me. You can ask questions in the Q&A discussion board. You can even call the Google Hangouts number on the syllabus. I'm here to help. This is a tricky week because it's not really into that philosophy portion of the class yet. We'll be jumping there next week uh, with talk of epistemology and, and how we know things and metaphysics and how uh, what there is. Uh, for this week, though, we need to focus our attention on just this process of being good critical thinkers. Because without being a good critical thinker, uh, philosophy and doing philosophy makes no sense. Trying to be persuasive, trying to evaluate someone else's persuasion makes no sense. We need to get good at this before we move forward. So if you have any questions, please feel free to speak up. Make sure you're doing your discussions. Uh, early in the week, midweek, uh, and make sure you are taking the assessment. If you've just added the course, make sure you're going back through last week, doing all that material, listening to the first lecture. Make sure that you are uh, doing assessment one and discussion one. You're responding to two fellow classmates. And uh, once again, if you have any questions, please, please uh, feel free and reach out. Otherwise, everybody have a good week. I look forward to the discussions this week and I will post uh, the lecture for next week uh, by next Monday, and we'll be sorted and ready to go for then. Have a good week, everybody.